In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, um, the Heavenly Father, God, uh, our beloved bridegroom, the lover of mankind, the lover of our souls. We thank you. We love you. Help us to love you. Thank you for giving us your word and all the life that it brings. Thank you for promising to be in our midst. Restore us, O oh Lord, to our first estate and to our first love. We ask you to please hear us through the intercessions of me and always seen so much so please you from the beginning through the mighty power of your love given cross. Please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us there our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us on into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right, we've got here okay. Um, last time we covered kind of a part of chapter two and a part of chapter three. We went from uh, I'm sorry, chapter one and chapter two. We went from uh, chapter one and verse uh, four or five until. Chapter 2 and verse 4, as usual, I'm going to cover just some of the main highlights and points to kind of hopefully refresh your memory of where we were. We said um, that is very wrong, and it is a sin to hate the sinners. Uh, and if we are to hate anything, we are to hate the sin, but to love our fellow sinner. And I intentionally say to love our fellow sinner, not to love the sinner. Lest we think that they are the sinner and I'm being good because I'm loving them. We're all sinners, our fellow sinners. Uh, also, we said that God is not a cruel God and that he tailors the consequences to each one according to their deeds. You remember he said, you know, I won't have mercy on Israel, but I will have mercy on Judah. It's not because he loved Judah more than Israel, but because Israel needed a little bit different um treatment different style he loves them equally just like parents who have children and they love them of course uh, all equally but they may have to use uh, resort to different methods of dealing with their children depending on how their children's uh, personality and how they behave uh, and we said that <clears throat> when Hosea took Gomer who does not deserve him at all as a wife when he took her as a wife and she went and gave herself to others, she conceived and bore Jezreel, Lorohama, and Luami. Likewise, when God chose to be our bridegroom and took us for his bride, even though we do not deserve him, if we go and give ourselves to another, whoever that other is, we too will end up bearing the fruit of our sin and A, we will be scattered We'll be scattered in our relationships. We'll be scattered in our heart. We'll be scattered in our life. B, we will not receive mercy. And C, we will not be his people. As in, you are my people. As in, away from me, I do not know you. Um. Then we made a, a like a nice note. It kind of maybe more of a Bible study study thing, which is that whenever you come across one of those words, yet, yeah, and right away start thinking of after the incarnation of the Lord or after after His first coming. And then we did a quick comparison between Israel according to the flesh and Israel according to the spirit. <clears throat> Israel according to the flesh are decreasing and dissipating. They are being just real. They are being scattered. While Israel, according to the Spirit, are being fortified and increasing. They are being the good Israel, being planted. And we said, who is Israel according to the Spirit? Anybody remember? Yes. The church. The church. The church. The believers. Um, she will remain and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. 
And then we made a, a, a neat discovery or, or meditation about the grain of sand, uh, or at least I did. I didn't know it before. I, I don't know about you guys, but we said that a grain of sand is small and weak and kind of like worthless or insignificant or unnoticed by itself. But when united together with many other grains of sand in one accord, together they can block the waves of the sea and the waters of the floods. And likewise, the children of God, while individually maybe as weak or unnoticed or insignificant as a grain of sand, but when they are, when we are united together in one accord, uh, we can be an impenetrable burial, a barrier against the evil waves uh, of the attacks of the world. And we can be guardians, if you will, or protectors of the world. Um, if we are united together, and if we love enough to open our mouths. Then at the end of chapter one, we said that God is the one who initiates the covenant. God is the one who maintains the covenant. God is the one who heals and supports and fortifies the covenant. And God is the one who fulfills the covenant. What do we do? <laughs> break the covenant. <laughs> we can't break it. But like we're, we're the ones who mess it up. Our job, man's job, is to just not mess it up and break the covenant. And we said that all God wants is that relationship with us. And our entry into that eternal relationship with God is what God causes. And our forbiddance from this eternal relationship with God is what we cause. And we should make our best effort not to cause. And then we got into chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter two, I think we covered only the first four verses. Uh, first, we said something that actually we've said many times before. We said, focus on the origin. You know, if, if, if you want to cut a weed, you don't just cut or trim the branch. You got to go way down to the root, to the source. If you want to fix anything you go to the origin focus on the origin so focus on your thoughts this is the battlefront where you do 90 percent of your spiritual warfare right here it's not people or circumstances or events or life or whatever it's it's all in here um and we said that if we regularly judge ourselves and work on our own repentance and work out our own salvation then God will have no need to judge us. And that's his promises to us. And then the last thing we said that, uh, which is really very important, and, and I, I really hope you're paying attention. You know, most of you, you have your cameras closed, uh, which is fine. But I hope you are listening to this. We said that, um, unfortunately, some of us focus on repenting from our our outward sin behaviors, to not yell, to not curse, to not gossip, to not judge or lust outwardly, to not say the bad thing or to not do the bad thing. But we allow it in our heart. We allow it in our mind, which is a catastrophe. Like we allow us, we don't do it outwardly, but we yell or curse or gossip or judge or lust in our mind, in our hearts. But we're happy because we're not doing it outwardly. This is a catastrophe, like because as it says in 1 Samuel, what God told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And, and and from a practical point of view, you can focus on the outward appearance, but the inward may still be bad. It's a very dangerous position to be in because it's like hypocritical. It's lukewarm. God doesn't like that because it's really dangerous for us. Or you can focus on the inward and for sure the outward will follow. 
It's not a maybe here because that is the source. Uh, if the source of the spring is sweet water, it will produce sweet water even down the road. If the source of the spring is bitter water, it will produce bitter water down the road. So if you focus on here, then it will show in the outward appearance. It will cover both. All right. And that's how much we covered last week. <clears throat> Comments, questions, concerns, compliments, anything. All righty. Buna. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in, in verse 4, I will not have mercy on her children, for they are children of harlotry. But, uh, Yani, what did they do, the children? They're, they don't know anything, Yani. They just came. Why he doesn't have mercy on them? This is a big, big question. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I want to go there, but this has to do with the uh, everlasting discussion or debate about did we inherit the uh, or related to did we inherit the guilt of the sin or just the consequence of the sin or um, you know as as like you know as it says like what we were in Adam's loins when he sinned. Um, uh, I don't want to get into that. But basically, like we said before, what you do never only affects you. Now, in this story here, as I've discovered, which I didn't know before, that when he says uh, her children are children of Hallworthy, even though Hosea took Gomer as his wife, she would leave him and go uh, commit adultery and cheat on him and then have children from those relationships. So they are children of, of harlotry. Um, yes. And children from from another are... from another Yani, um, what's the word? Logical point of view. Perhaps it's not a judgment, but it is a foreknowledge, meaning that think about the children of such a person who is like Gomer. How are they gonna grow up to be? Chances yeah. are they're gonna grow up like Gomer. Yes. And so chances are they will also reject God and not have his mercy, not because he's punishing them for her sake, just because of how they're going to be. Meaning it, it, maybe it's it's more of a prediction or, or a foretelling as opposed to a um, pass, passing on the punishment. Okay, thank you. You know, when um, I remember a long time ago, I don't remember what book we were studying, the Bible study, okay. several years back. Um, somebody was asking, like, in the Old Testament, when, when, why did God tell them, like, when they go to these, you know, bad cities or like Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever, why, why destroy the children too, like the little children, the babies, you know, haram. And, um, and we, we discovered the analogy that says, like, how if you discovered a uh, like a what's the word I'm looking for like a giant snake or something in your house or a poisonous snake in your house you will um, kill that snake okay but what if that snake had laid eggs are you going to say oh they're cute they're going to be nice and like little cute snakes or baby snakes or whatever no you're going to kill them too why because you know that they are grown to be grow to be just like their parent, to be poisonous snakes too. Excuse me, Abuna? Yes. Can, can, can you hear me? Fine. Okay. So I'll go to the other room now. Um, can we look at this as like, this is an object lesson for spiritual realities later on. So could we look at this as any of the children or like the fruit that is produced from our own harlotry will like God will never look kindly on that, that whatever the, the things are that we grow from walking away from him, that those are the things that are being judged. I think that's brilliant, actually, because what will be the children or the fruit of our walking away from God? 
we'll read them in many of the epistles. You know, lusts, yes. rivalries, uh, drunkenness, uh, fornication, sexual immorality. Um, you know, this is the 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 child. These are the children of our harlotry, uh, if you will. So naturally, they're they're nasty. They're they're by definition they don't get mercy. That's a that's a very good point. Thank you. See, y'all, that's why I love discussions in Bible study. Because then we can all benefit, we can all help each other. I don't like what everybody's muted, kidda, and who knows if they're sleeping or or what. Um, don't sleep. Okay. Uh, also, Abuna. Yes. Uh, I joined a little late. Maybe you already said that. Uh, also, uh, through these two chapters so far, he, the God is drawing parallelism or analogy between uh, uh, Josiah's wife and the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. So when when he's talking about her children, he's talking about the children of Israel. And in this case, we wouldn't say the children of Israel. What is their fault? Actually, Israel became adulterous because of their sins hmm. because Israel is a nation it's not a human so I think her children are the Israelites yes we need we need to it's kind of hard to to remember this but we learned this very much in in Isaiah uh and we see it here really in, in all the prophets in no it, it has application uh <clears throat> excuse me like now or in the near future and it yes. has application after the first coming, and it has application after the second coming sometimes. Um, all righty. So let's read from verse, since we finished with verse 4, let's read from verse, verse 5 through 13. 5 through 13. And let's see who will read for us. Uh, Ruth, would you read for us? Sure. Thank you. Oops, five right there. One of the fathers, some Holy Spirit, one God in there. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceives them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths she will chase her lovers but not overtake them yes she will seek them but not find them then she will say i will go and return to my first husband for then it was better for me than now for she did not know that i gave her grain new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they have prepared for ball. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen, give to her cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines, her fig trees, of which she had said, these are my wages that my lover has given me. So I will make them a forest and the beast of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of all which she burned incense and decked herself with new earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers but me she forgot, says the Lord. Therefore, behold, Glory I will lose God. her. Well, last word, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever. Amen. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Let's start with the verse five. Because this it says, a, For their mother has, you were asking about why the children, I will not have mercy on the children of Holy Tree. All right there. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them, has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who will give me my... Can you think about that? Like, how can anyone have many lovers? It should only be one, right? 
right there from the get-go. But I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, and my drink. The person who goes after whatever satisfies my senses, like my physical needs, and then wants to ignore the spiritual. My bread means what? My food. My water means like my drink. My wool means like what I wear in the winter. My linen is what I wear in the summer. My oil is what, what anoints me, what heals me. It's used for, for medicine. Like if you recall the Good Samaritan, he he uh, was um, anointing the, the, the injured man with oil. My wine or my drink means my delights, what 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 my delight, what delights my heart. <clears throat> so basically, I will get, I will seek all the stuff. Basically, it's all physical senses, and I will seek them from uh, my lovers and ignoring the spiritual. So, what do you notice in this? When she says, "Who give me my bread and my water, and my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink," there are actually. Three things that are wrong with this kind of person here who has this, this mentality, this attitude. What do you notice? It's all about they focus on the material. Mind. Okay. Uh, Mama, what did you say? It's all about my, my, my. Very good. So that's the first one. Self-consumption. Yeah. Me, me, my, 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 what I want, what I need, what makes me happy, what fulfills me. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing that, that bothers God when, when people um, have this attitude. And then, Missy, what did you say? That they focus on the material. Yes. Like Martha's saying, all earthly needs. There you go. Yes, in the chat. Um Aruna? Uh, focusing on, oh. on the senses, the physical needs, and nothing in, on the spiritual. Just food and drink and clothes and comfort and merriment and joy. Yes, Ruth. Um, what's the significance of the like difference in capitalization of my for just between water, wool, linen, and oil and drink? Uh, that's just a typo in the app. Oh, okay. Thank you. Because some are small and some are cap uh, capitalized, but... In the app, there's just typos. If you look at other versions, they will all be small. Good catch. Okay, okay so we said that self-consumption and the other one is focusing on the senses or the physical or earthly needs. And what and what is the the third thing we notice here? She called them the, her lovers, but they don't actually really love her. See? True. That's another the thing that we're, we're going to get to also. But like uh, about, um, I guess about her herself. Mm. About her oil, Abuna? No, no. It's about everything. So basically what, what she says, my lovers who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my linen and my oil. There's a sense of entitlement here. I am owed my food and my drink and my clothes and my comfort and my happiness, as opposed to um, a sense of gratitude for being given those things. <clears throat> um, it's like, forgiving me mine, forgive me what I deserve, kind of a thing. So three things that really bother God when his children do them. Because they are very harmful to his children and seriously threaten their salvation. What are they? Self-consumption, a sense of entitlement, and being consumed with the physical only and neglecting the spiritual. Of course, we need to be mindful of the physical. We have needs. We have clothes. We have bills. We have all kinds of you know stuff that we need to, to be aware of. But to be consumed with only the physical and ignore or neglect the spiritual. And speaking of um, of that, like there's a couple of nice verses in, in the Psalms. Psalm um, 19, verses 10 and 11, it talks about somebody who gets it, somebody who, who sees 
like the the delight to the or the desire for the spiritual along with the physical. In Psalm 19, verses 10 and 11, it says, A, The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much refined pure gold, and sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is great delight and reward. Some of us may say these words about things that are physical material. That's kind of not balanced. Um, also, Psalm 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, you have put joy in my heart more than when their grain and new wine and oil are abundant. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord... Have me dwell in your hope and safety. Somebody who gets it. <clears throat> they don't feel consumed with self. They don't feel uh, uh, entitled. And they're not focused only on the earthly. If anything, they're focused more on the on the spiritual. By the way, I, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. Uh, just remember that. We'll, we'll address, well, I don't know if we'll have time to get to it near the end, but we'll see. Um, so she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, and my drink. Question, is it really her lovers that give her those things? No. No. Who really is the one who, who's giving her her food and her drink and all her needs? God himself. So the whole the whole view is like looking at other people as our source, looking at other people as the one who give us food and drink and satiation and fulfillment and whatever. But these people ended up making gods or idols of uh, grain and wine and and oil and there's actually I mean literally made idols out of them. Like for example. The, the Roman goddess uh, Ceres. That's that's uh, the goddess of uh, grain. Or the Roman goddess uh, of wine is Bacchus. Like the city in Alexandria, Bacchus. It's named after the Roman goddess of wine. <laughs> what do you think of that? Um and gods of oil, like the Greek goddess of oil. Do you know what the Greek goddess of oil is called? This might surprise you. Athena. So, so they forgot or ignored that it is God who gives them all these things. All lies. These are all lies. So, in summary, to pursue... And to seek after your fulfillment and satiation and comfort and joy from anything other than God is to believe and to live the most common lie that mankind lives and receives from the father of lies. Not going to happen. In verse 6, therefore... Uh, <laughs> As we learned in Isaiah, most of the time when you when you hear God saying, therefore, what follows is most likely not going to be very pleasant. Look at this, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns. What does this mean? Imagine, Kedah, you're walking through a path that has hedges full of thorns on both sides. It means like... Her path will be full of continuous pain. But sometimes people don't pay much attention to the pain. And they insist on their heading in the wrong direction. Which causes God to go to the next step. So I will hedge your way with thorns and I will wall her in so that she cannot find her path. She, she will often feel blocked 
or lost or confused. Like, like there's some force working against her. And then verse 7, what else? She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek Abuna. them, but not... Yes? Sorry, can you go back to 6, please? Uh, I wall her in so that she cannot find her path. Can you explain it more? Or Imagine that you're walking, like you're in a maze. You walk in this way and you find the wall in front of you. So you go this way and you find another wall in front of you. You go that way, you find another wall uh, in front of you. Like stumbles, Yanni. Blocks. Blocks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Verse seven says, "A look, look at the. Imagine how she feels if you are in her shoes. God forbid, she will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Meaning, she will not catch them. She will not reach them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Such a person who is consumed with self, feeling entitled, and uh, focused only on the earthly and not at all the spiritual." Um, uh, such a person will keep thinking, ah, oh, if only dot, 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 then I'll be happy. If only I, I get this job, then I'll be happy. If only if I get married, then I will be happy. If only uh, whatever, then I'll be happy. Then I will be content. Then I will be satisfied. And alas, to such a person, this happiness or contentment or satisfaction or fulfillment are like, a, a, what is it called? A mirage of water in the desert that can never be grasped. You know, when somebody's walking in the desert and they see what looks like water, they run to it, they seek after it, and then disappointment. There's nothing there. Um, and now we see very clearly why God causes this or allows this in our lives sometimes <clears throat> why lord the thorns and the and wall in her paths and have her seek after her lovers and not find any satisfaction any contentment or whatever then right here you see that do you see my arrow my pointer on the text okay then this is his purpose she will say i will go and return to my first husband for then it was better for me than now does this sound familiar? I will go and return. For then it was better than me than now. Yes, a prodigal son. Yes. Bro, the prodigal son said, I will get up and go back to my father. Because even if I'm a servant in his place, it'd be better than this. Definitely better than now. Listen, Excuse me, Abuna. Yes, ma'am. You know, last week when we were talking in the Bible study, in the college Bible study about Deuteronomy 28, 63, about how God rejoices when they obey, but he will also rejoice like in their destruction. Do you think that this, like what you're talking about now, that 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 his um, like barring things up is the the scattering and the the destruction that he brings on his people? And that his rejoicing is because, like it says here, that it's in, in an effort to have them return to him. Exactly. He rejoices in causing that pain to them because it will bring them back. This is what I was going to say right now. Is that God does not enjoy causing us pain or suffering. He only resorts to this method if we ignore all his other attempts to bring us back to him in order to save us. So... If you ever find yourself feeling continuously unhappy, uh, dissatisfied, unfulfilled, this might be a good time to ask yourself if there's something you need to repent of. God does not rejoice in causing us pain for the sake of causing us pain, but as Missy said from Deuteronomy, is that he, he rejoices in these afflictions because, you know, as we say, people don't always change when they see the light, but they may change when they feel the heat. Um, 
you know, like a, like a, when when a parent takes their child to to get their vaccination shot or to have a surgery or something, um, they're not they are happy. They're not happy because their pain their child is like screaming and, and then pain and stuff, but they're happy because of what this pain will lead to. And it's actually they are causing or allowing this pain because they love their child and they want to save their child. So you can say it this way. You know how they say when the going gets tough? We'll kind of change that a little bit. When the going gets tough, ask yourself if God is trying to get your attention to get you to repent from something. Okay, verse 8. For she did not know, oh, see? She did not know that I gave her grain and new wine and oil. She thought that what got her all this, that stuff was others or herself or her hard work or whatever. But she refused to realize that it is God who provided all that. And not only that, but to add insult to injury, says, even the gold and silver that I provided for her in plenty, says what, and multiplied her silver and gold. What did she do with it? They prepared it for Baal. They made idols or temples or whatever for these uh, lords or these gods, small g gods. Question. I have to ask. I have to ask myself with you. Do you sometimes use the gifts that God gave you to pursue after idols in your life? I was just on the... Where did I hear that? Somewhere on the radio yesterday or earlier today it said, someone said like very, it's a very profound thing that even the richest people ever, they always say a little more. I need to make a little more. The richest people in the world. Do you sometimes use the gifts that God gave you to pursue after idols in your life? Whether it be your car, your children, um, your home, your career, your job. Uh, and now here comes another one of those therefores. Verse 9. Therefore, on, 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 I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. God is correcting multiple things here. What are they? He's depriving her from her comfort or from her uh, earthly comfort. So yes. she may wake up. Yes. What else? Mm -hmm. The first thing he's correcting here in verse 9, he's... He's Same saying... Mark. Hmm? Yes, very good. He's yes. Mind. He's saying, no, Habibi, please remember, don't forget, this is my grain, my wine, my wool and linen. These are mine, and I share them with you in their seasons, which I also have determined and said, by the way. Even the season of when these come, they don't come too early or too late. They come in their time. Uh, yes, Martha. I'm not sure what the word um, in English. Could it mean that he will take away a set that he gave us? Exactly. Yes. Yes. The covering. Yes, we're going to address that in, in, in a sec. Very good. So before we get to that one, though, there's another point. What else? Is God correcting? Why is God going to take away his gifts? 
so that when she seeks them from her so-called lovers, they will not be able to provide them for her, right? Because God stopped them. So hopefully, she will then realize who is the real source of these gifts and who uh, is her real lover. So to clarify to her like that he is the source, and number two it is that he is the lover, and number three, like Mark, Martha said, he said what? I will uncover her nakedness. No more covering. Why? It's like what Martha said. Listen, sometimes because God keeps covering us in the sight of others, it's the first thing we thank him for, the thanksgiving prayer. Let us give thanks, for he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, etc. But the first one we thank for is covered us. So sometimes because, because God keeps covering us in the sight of others, we too end up forgetting that our sins and flaws and our iniquities do exist. <laughs> and it is only by God's grace that he's covering us in the sight of others. And it gets to our head. Like we join the others in not seeing our sins and our flaws and our weaknesses. And we stop repenting or we stop being humble. Which drives God. Yeah, that's I'll, I'll use that term. Which drives God, which causes God to expose us a little bit to others and to expose us a little bit, more importantly, to who? To ourselves. Why? He likes to rub it in. He likes to make us suffer. No. So that we would feel ashamed and feel humbled and repent and return to him and completely rely on him. And again, this is all only for the purpose of saving us. God is not e egotistical. He's not narcissistic. He doesn't want us to just love him or, or worship him for the sake of he wants, he likes that or whatever. No. It's because... Everything God does is that is for the sake of our salvation. This reminds me of the Friday Theotokia. Yes, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. Very good. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Back to the point of returning to God and listening carefully to his voice to change our life. Um, I don't want to reach the point of suffering or feeling pain to return back to God. Mm -hmm. And I recently was thinking about the expression in a, the, the, the epistle of Hebrew, the, the trained sense, senses, the hawas mm -hmm. al In the I. I want to go deeper in in that expression actually and and comparing with with the returning to God like how we can train our senses how we can like have this sensitive emotional I don't know to mm. just listen just return just like don't wait for to suffer or to feel the pain mm -hmm. to return back. It's a very good question. Um, and it's a very smart question because if I do dot, 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 then God will have no reason to resort to this pain and suffering for the sake of saving me. But he may resort to it for the sake of helping me to help to elevate me. To, to make me stronger or better, just like gold is purified by the fire. So I guess the first thing is to don't expect that we will go through life without pain or suffering or whatever. As St. Paul said, um, that, that what is, we must through many tribulations, uh, uh, we must make it to heaven, make it to is the promised land. 
Well, well, that's related to count it all mm -hmm. joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. But but to address you, you but anyway, the, the first thing I'm trying to say is that um, I'm just saying this in case of the person's motivation is that, well, I don't want God to have to resort to take away stuff and to, and to cause me to suffer and to pain and to feel this horrible stuff. Okay, that's wonderful. But um, just know that even if you're doing the right things, there will still be sufferings and pains. Many are the tribulations of the righteous, but out of them all, the Lord will deliver them. As the Psalm says. Um, now, how do I reduce this stuff? How do I at least keep God from resorting to pain and suffering just for the sake of saving me, as opposed to for the sake of elevating me? Because there's, there's two different categories here. I would say first and foremost, the sacrament of repentance and confession. You know, if I if I'm exposing myself, if I'm judging myself, if I'm Yani, if I'm exposing myself, why will God have to expose my nakedness? Why will God to ha have to uncover me? He won't, because I'm doing it already. If I if I judge myself, then He will have no reason to judge me, like we said, I think last week or the week before. So sincere, open, transparent, full exposure, sacrament of repentance and confession, and to do it regularly. Not once every, you know, five, six months or, or once a year. I think the the second thing is to be deeply in God's word. Like regularly, continuously for the rest of our life in God's word. So that the more we are in his word, the more we read, the more we know him, the more we know how he wants us to live. And the more we don't stray from how he wants us to live, so the more we don't give him a reason to have to yank us. <clears throat> if we if we live within the boundaries he gave us, then then he doesn't have to resort to any of that stuff. Um, I was gonna say a third thing. Uh, repentance, confession, his word. Oh, uh. Uh, you were asking about how to be sensitive and stuff like that to God. I was going to say it's like uh, by being obedient, by being attentive and obedient, all of us on maybe a daily basis hear God's voice or the Holy Spirit talking to us. Hey, call this person. Hey, get up and pray. Hey, say sorry. Hey, go help. Hey, you know, like all, all these things. The Holy Spirit doesn't say, hey, <laughs> but I'm just saying, Yanni, if, if the more you, I'm not going to say if, the more you, you, you pay attention to this and the more you respond, he said, well, uh, uh, when you hear his voice today, when you hear his voice, do not, do not harden your heart. Like when you, as soon as you hear his voice, whatever, respond, the more you do this, the more. Uh, louder and clearer he will be and the more attentive you will be and the more you will um, obey and then the more specific the the directions will be. We talked about this before, like in, in the book of Acts, it's amazing how, you know, the Holy Spirit said, separate for me Barnabas and Saul, and you're out of everybody, by, by name, Keda. or don't go to this city, go to that city. That'd be so nice. Like, like, just basically kind of like a GPS in life. And we'll take a right here or like in a half a mile, you're going to turn left or whatever. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, uh, Max, but I would say the sacrament of repentance and confession, being in his word, like really sincerely to know him more. And thirdly, to uh, practice listening and attentiveness and being obedient to it. You're there, Devon. You're exactly there. Thank you so much. Uh, and you mentioned something here. I wanted to talk to you individually later. Thank you. Sure. Okay, now I have a question for you because this question has caused some issues before. <clears throat> Not for you, Moody, but yeah, for the, everybody. Oh, you scared me. <laughs> Does, <laughs> that's, that's to help you stay awake when you're driving. Does God punish? 
you tell me yes, I want to know why or how. If you tell me no, I want to know what, why or how. I would say yes. Okay. Uh, Anyone else? Okay. No, he disciplines. I would say no. Oh, sorry. Okay. I got a yes and two no's. I want to know from all the group. I think God used to punish in the Old Testament, but I think in the New Testament we have like the forgiveness. We we can always go back, and He would accept us. Okay. Um, I I don't know if he's like I want to say no, but sometimes we because he's so patient, so sometimes we make the mistake and he's so patient and he did or do punish us later on but we don't relate it because it took so long took him so long to like teach us the lesson so it, I, i'm not so sure i'm like i would say no because i i don't see okay. that he punishes anymore uh, uh Buna, one more thing just to add uh, sorry yeah. we may think that he's punishing us but he may Things may be happening for our best. Okay. Rafa? Uh, I think, yes, he, he punished, but the purpose is different. In life, the purpose is for chastisement, for us to repent. In the after, after judgment, the punishment is for justice. Hey. So... I also want to say that, is he not a judge? Does a judge not discipline slash punish? Does a good parent not punish their child if they love them? So I'm going to lean towards the punishment, but slash discipline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Great Buna, answers. I can, Are you? I, I can say I punish myself by my misbehavior. Okay, but, but yeah, that's 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 true. Um, but but no, I harm myself. Really, is, is the better term. Um, but I'm actually focusing on. Uh, it's not a trick question. I'm I'm focused on. Does God punish or not? The answer is drum roll. Is, on, did on, we on. lose Abuna? Nam. What? Oh, sorry, Abuna. <laughs> it was silence. I thought we lost you. Oh. Okay. Uh, did I mute myself? Or no, no, no. It, it might be my inter internet. Yeah, uh, kind of... Okay. So the answer to this question, does God punish? The answer is yes. And yes. let me explain. Sorry, I'm just muting. Um, some people really struggle with this terminology. And they'd rather say, no, God doesn't punish. He only... Let us uh, lets us receive the consequences of our bad choices in order to discipline us, because they feel like the term to punish is harsh or lacking love or is maybe vindictive. Even though God said in Deuteronomy thirty two thirty five what, and actually Saint Paul quoted this twice in Romans twelve nineteen and in Hebrews ten thirty, God said, "Vengeance is mine," says the Lord. Okay, but while this may seem like just semantics, it's actually, they are very important semantics because they really affect how we look at God. And it is of utmost important to know God and that we keep growing in knowing God. It is not vengeance or retaliation for the purpose of causing pain. It is punishment and pain for the purpose of causing awakening, repentance, and returning to God. For the purpose of causing salvation. So I think, because I hear many people, you know, uh, kind of go back and forth. And actually many churches, capital C churches or, or nations like kind of debate about this. And I think it's 
it's all like cementing in the way of how we look at the word punish and more importantly, for what purpose? <clears throat> Those who struggle to say that God punishes, they look at punishment as, okay, you misbehaved, I will cause you pain. Or, or you did this, I'm going to do this to you. Um, and those who, who will accept it, I will say like God punish, like some of you said, for the purpose of saving you. Like in Hebrews 12, 6, this is a very important verse. Hebrews 12, 6, 6 is half of 12. So hopefully you remember it. It says, for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines he chastises and he punishes every son whom he accepts. So don't get hung up on the semantics, but I think what we can all agree, and whether you say, no, it's not punish, it's discipline or consequence or chastise or whatever, or it's training, we can all agree that whatever you're going to call it, it is like for a good loving purpose for the sake of saving us. <clears throat> and actually, that's what he's doing here in the next few verses. He's punishing her. I'm going to read uh, like four verses to you and then kind of break them down. But I wanted to read them together. Now, look at this. I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. And no one shall deliver her from my hand. Now, someone, somebody reads this like, whoa. Some people actually struggle with Christianity because they read stuff like this and they don't understand the whole picture. It's very dangerous to just rely on one verse or two verse and like not see the whole Bible end to end. I will also cause all her mirth to cease. What does mirth mean? Joy, <laughs> merriment, enjoyment, laughter. <clears throat> I will cause all her mirth to cease. Her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. Oops. What am I doing? Verse 12. And I will destroy her vines, her fig trees, for which she said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish. Uh -huh. There it is. I will punish her for the days of Baals, plural. We're going to talk about that in a minute. To which she burned incense. She decked herself. I didn't realize. I thought decked was a slang word. You said, oh, you're all decked out or whatever. <laughs> But apparently, no, it's, uh, you know, you learn stuff. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. All right, let's go back. First of all, notice that <clears throat> God is intentionally calling them what? Remember when he said, uh, my wheat, my vine, my wine, my oil, my drink, my whatever? Look at, look at verse 12. I will destroy her feast days, her moons, her Sabbaths. What are feast days, moons, and Sabbaths? Those were the times appointed uh, for the Lord. Yes, exactly. He's saying what? Yeah, whatever, like the stuff that you're doing, you think it's honoring me or worshiping me or celebrating my nativity, my my resurrection, my, uh, 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 you know, theophany or my baptism or uh, my transfiguration or whatever. No, these I'm not considering these mine. These are yours. He's not accepting them. So listen to this. If people are celebrating major feasts of the Lord, in lewd ways that are against God's commandments, he declares he's looking at them as feasts for them. He will not accept them as feasts for him. So be careful, lest when you uh, uh, go to church to celebrate a certain feast, 
and then at night leave the church and go celebrate in another way that is directly against him and what he likes and, and what he told us to do. This is something messed up here. It's like confusing. And then also, there's, Mama, were you going to ask something or say something? Okay. There's a very important message in verse 11. Say, says, can I say what I want to say? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I remember oh, Pope Shenouda used to say, when, when there, English, please. Yes, I remember when <clears throat> Pope Shenouda used to say, it's it is fearful, fearful to fall in the hand of the Lord, which yes. is a verse. I used to, is it a verse? Oh. I think so. He used to say that at the time when uh, this terrorist used to destroy the churches and bomb it and kill the people and all this. Or when when he, he, he raised a case, but he doesn't get the answer. Or they say, no, this person is innocent. He didn't do it. Things like that, Jan. He doesn't take his rights. Um, thank you. Well, Abuna, to, so, go ahead, Missy. To go back to your point about, you know, like we need to be careful if we're going to celebrate uh, a particular feast and then go do something hmm. outrageous like that's against God. But I think that it's even more of an indictment on on us, myself, that have allowed like the culture to, to and by culture, I mean like the American culture, to um, to infiltrate where we actually like lose the feeling of, or the meaning of what it is that we're going and celebrating that it's, it's all about like with particularly with like with Christmas or the nativity that it's really like materialism, commercialism. It's about all of the uh, um, accoutrements of, of the season mm. versus really what it's about. It's about, uh, the decorations or the Christmas tree or putting lights on the house or like enjoying yeah, the exactly. driving through the neighborhoods and enjoying the lights, which are all okay. These are, these are great, but to not lose sight of the whole why the reason for the feast to start out with. Right. <clears throat> uh, where was I? Oh yeah. Verse 11 has a very important message. It says a, I will also cause all her mirth to cease. And we said that mirth means like laughter, joy, fun, merriment, enjoyment. I will cause them to cease, all of them. Listen, uh, this is a very you know, nice, you know, profound uh, quote that I came across when preparing for tonight's Bible study. If people do not remove lewdness and sin from their feasts and from their celebrations, then God will remove the mirth and enjoyment from their lewdness and sin. Yani, if, if, if we as a people don't remove the wrong from our joys, then God will remove the joys from our joys. So I'll say it again. If we do not remove the lewdness and sin from our priests and celebrations, then God will remove the mirth and enjoyment from uh, the lewdness and sin. We will we will not um, have that enjoyment even when we do those things. Have you ever seen someone laugh so hard and all of a sudden the last turn into crying? I've seen it more on TV, I think, but but I've seen it. Like it's it's like this person's like they're trying so hard to do anything to find mirth again, even by forcing themselves to laugh out loud. And sometimes as they are doing it, 
as they are laughing out loud, they feel so sad because the voice is coming out, ha, 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 but inside they're so sad and, and they're so discontent that instantly their laughter turns into crying and wailing and to really bitter tears. They will keep doing the sin, but still not have any enjoyment. And we see that in people who, who initially, when you do this, and why does sin work? Because initially there is sweetness there. There is enjoyment there. But people who remain in this, eventually they'll do the sin and still feel nothing. And, and that's why they become miserable and, and sometimes sadly end their lives. The Egyptian people, they're expecting sadness after laughing all this. <laughs> Allah, my God. Allah, my God. <laughs> no, that's that's different. That's just because... Yeah, I know, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sometimes life is very hard, so... Well, <laughs> I'm not gonna even... <laughs> oh, okay. Verse 12. He says, And I will destroy her vines and her figs, fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. So... I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. The vine is a symbol of joy, and the fig is a symbol of uh, nourishment or satiation. So God is saying here something like, okay, she thinks it is her lovers who fulfill her and give her joy, that her joy and fulfillment come from others. Okay. I will remove them so this way her quote-unquote lovers will have nothing to give her. And hopefully, hopefully, then she will realize that it is all from me, not from them. And hopefully then this realization will cause her to repent and to return so that I may be able to forgive her and accept her and save her. Remember this quote, it's uh, by St. Augustine. He said that God who created you without you cannot save you without you. Like if you don't participate, I'm sorry, even if you're baptized, even if you go to church and take communion, if you don't um, return to your bridegroom, and to know who your, the little lover of mankind is, and to repent and to love him, meaning keep his commandments and live according to his will within his boundaries, then God, you're not giving God a choice. Like, what are you giving him? Then, then he can't save you. I like the quote by Pope Shunur. He said, we are not saved by our works, as some other denominations may erroneously think. We are not saved by our works, but we cannot be saved without our works. Because faith without works is dead. So um, they show our uh, faith. Um, it's really neat to see how uh, in Zechariah 3, it is so related here to Hosea 2. Zechariah chapter 3 and Hosea 2. Uh, that chapter in Zechariah 3 is talking about the time of salvation, the coming of the branch capital B branch, the Jesus of Nazareth. You know, Nazareth uh, means what? Branch. Nasir. It says, this is in Zechariah 3.10. It says, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Meaning what? Everyone will be joyful and fulfilled and satiated. Um, speaking of the, the vine and the fig tree. <clears throat> okay, let's go to verse 13. Excuse me. I will punish her for the days of the bowels to which she burnt incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. 
There were many Baals back then, lots of Baals. Baal means the Lord of or the master of. Okay, there were like, for example, uh, well, I'll ask you, do you know any Baal? Baal something, Baal this, Baal that. There's one of them that's really easy that you hear often, actually, in a few Gospels uh, during the liturgies. As in the Arabic culture, the husband, Baal, do you think it is related to that? In Arabic culture, what? The husband is Baal? Actually, it is. Yeah. Baal. It yeah. is in the sense that Baal means master. Yes. But I, I'm going to address this uh, near the end of the chapter. So that's a very good observation. But it's not Baal as in like a, a dumb god or dumb idols. <laughs> so, but yes, it is the same word, not related. It's actually the same word. Word. So, for example, one you have all heard is Baal Zabub. In English, it's Bilzabob, but it's Baal Zabub, which means the god of the flies, Bilzabub. small g guy, small g god, or the the Lord of the Flies. Uh, I think they made a movie called The Lord of the Flies, which was, I think, a bad movie or a scary movie. I didn't watch it. Um, it's, a it's a book, um, Buna. Oh, it's a book? Okay. Yeah, very good uh, book. There's also something called Baal Berith. Baal Berith is the god of the covenant. This is a, a, a small G god that they made um, a crediting of um, freeing them. Uh, also, if you know Arabic, you know this one. Baal Fagur. Have you ever heard of like uh, Fagr or Fagr? Yes. Baal Fagur is the god of fornication. They mean even the god of fornication. Can we leave that? There's uh, Baal Hamun, which is the god of fertility. Anyway, so so they had many Baals, many many small g gods. They made many Baals and offered incense to them. If I were God, like I, I'd be like irate. Not to save them, I'd just be mad. I was telling you this story with somebody uh, a couple of days ago, um, back before the priesthood. Um, <laughs> This is a public confession. Um, sometimes, you know, be at home having dinner and stuff. And I tell Missy, you know what, Missy? Because in my work, like I dealt with thousands of people. Uh, she goes, what? I tell her, it's a good thing I'm not God. She goes, what? I said, it's a good thing I'm not God. Why? Because if I were God, I would have just annihilated all of humanity. I would have just done, done with it and let just let's keep it. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, perfection. Who needs this? <laughs> Um, so um, they made many bowels and offered incense to those bowels instead of to God to whom incense should be offered and the God who actually made the incense and the trees that produce the incense and not only that but they decked themselves for the sake of those bowels put on earrings and jewelry and nice clothes and all that stuff for the sake of these things that their hands made. And also what they dedicated, what they accredited to the blessings that they had in their life, whether it be fertility or, or uh, you know, farming or sea or whatever. And then he ends it with a, a very, I don't know what to call it, a very sad statement. But me, she forgot. I like the order of it. Instead of, but she forgot me. Like how he said, but me? She forgot, says the Lord. Why do people tend to remember God in times of needs, in times of difficulties, in times of suffering, but they tend to forget God in times of plenty and joy and success? If we do this, it's like we are, quote-unquote, forcing God to, 
get our attention to punish us. Like, like you know, what Max was asking about earlier. It's really in our hands, y'all. Let's let's kind of examine ourselves and see: Am I a person who runs to God and talks with God and and lives according to God's will in good times too, as well as in bad? In sorry, Buna, can as you... well as in poorer. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, can you repeat the part of um, forget me or some? I didn't. I didn't hear that uh, sure. very well. It's it's at the end. I was saying I like the word choice. It's at the end of verse 13 here. He said, he didn't say, but she forgot me. The the order of the word is is um is important. But me, she forgot. It's an emphasis here. The 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 one, the true lover of her soul. The one who can only fulfill and say she, the one who brings mirth, real mirth. She forgot. Uh, uh, Michael, I think you were going to say something. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, you, you said what you said. What I was about to say was, it's not, and as I understand it, it's not that the people of Israel completely abandoned God entirely. They would go to Him when they felt like they were mm -hmm. in trouble. I, I mean they blended everything together. They blended all their gods together and says, well, God, you could have a space in my heart when I need you. And I mean, that's exactly what we do today, right? That's so I, I think it's important for us to understand that it's not like they completely abandoned him a hundred percent. They just set him off to the side in case of emergency. Yep. Yep. And, and really, I'll speak for myself. For a long time, I say, man, these Israelites are such doofuses. They're so dumb. They're so whatever. But like, y'all, we do the same thing even until today. Even have, after the incarnation of the Lord, even after being Christians in the new church, in the New Testament, in the, in the spiritual uh, Israel, in the heavenly Jerusalem, like, we still do that. Yeah. I, what can I say? We're sheep. We're sheep. Perhaps a question you can ask yourself, and I think every single one of us has also many bows that we attribute a credit to for things that we should attribute to God and that we um, deck ourselves for and we highly regard with incense. And um, we seek, you know, protection or provision or comfort or rest or whatever from instead of, of God. Okay. After this fun <laughs> uh, four chapters, 9 to 13, after, yani, until now, God has been using like really harsh words. And talking harshly, it's like, I will punish. I will destroy your vines and figs. I will. But look and see how sweet, how unbelievably sweet the Lord is. Even though me, she forgot. But we will continue that next week, God willing, because it's 825. So I'm going to leave it on a expectant note. Good marketing, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to stop here. It's wow. I'm running quickly today. Uh, thank you all for your sharing and your discussion and stuff. It really uh, adds another you know, level to the whole thing. Um, tell you, before we part ways until next week, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? As usual. So I think um, it's beautiful. Yes, I think it's the first time for me too to see the sweetness be be behind uh, these words because I think in a way, if he really didn't care, it would be worse, you know? Mm. So it's like behind this language, 
I perceived a big amount of love and um, I don't know if the word zeal is correct to use. I don't know, zeal, what, what is zeal? It's like a being jealous, being cited with, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I don't know. I perceived that today. It's like he, it's like you are, you're mine. And like you are forgetting sometimes like the road and you're going away and I'm bringing mm. you. I'm not letting you, like you're not, not going to be you there. Go. Yeah. Exactly. Like not I'm going to let you display you're not, so. Yes. And I love that. And in a way I felt like it's, um it's also like, we don't have like a, a passive God. Mm. He's, he's active he's initiative he's he's right there you know so i felt that strong stronger today and i think it's beautiful and again uh, even the punishment part i think it's not i don't know i don't have a word to it but i i was thinking of even the way he's punishing it's punishing in integrity and it's a, a huge it's there is a difference between punishing for punishing and punishing to correct and orchestrated the best for every one in the situation. Yeah. And it's also, it's very loving. So It's punishing so, out of love. Yes. And nothing else. And justice. God is... Yeah, he, he keeps, uh, what's the word, Yani? Humbling himself. He keeps, um, you know, like if, if any other human being he would say, like, what? No, I'm the karamti. Alas, you're gonna go and 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 even though you're my wife, you're gonna go and like play the harlot with all these other people. Like, Alas, go, toz. You know, but and we're gonna talk about that later in the, in the rest of the chapter. But like um in the first that says, even if we are faithless, God remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. Um, and we saw a ton of that in the book of Isaiah. If y'all haven't attended, it's it's on the YouTube channel. But just he keeps pursuing, even though we keep <laughs> rejecting and betraying. It, his his love doesn't make sense. Thank God for that. Okay, anyone else? Questions, comments, anything? Yeah, I think anyone who's ever punished a child for anything. There's two things that are going on in that person who's punishing them. It's one, they're already thinking of, well, first of all, it pains them if they truly love that child. And number two, they're already like planning on the outcome, the positive out of it. And, you know, well, as soon as they get out of this punishment, we can, you know, I hope they'll be better off and we'll go and we'll play. All or, or all or continue on the good thing. So, and in God, in a way, He's already He's doing that. First, it pains Him, but He's already telling Him about what the the beautiful outcome will be at the end. Yes, unfortunately, Michael, Yanni, and I was guilty of some of this uh, sometimes way back when our kids were little. But some parents punish because they're just so angry. You you disobeyed me. You caused me so much agony. So I'm going to cause you pain for the sake of causing you pain because I'm so angry with you. Um, but that's, that's, that's why some people struggle with the word punish because they're looking at that kind of punishment. I guess we can say there's, there's two kinds of punishment or two types. Um, and it's, it's the difference is what are they driven by and what is the purpose? What is their purpose? Uh, one thing also I forgot to mention to, to in response to Norma's point that do you know what they say the worst form or the worst type of child abuse is? Neglect. 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 Negligence. That's the worst form of child abuse. So, so like when Norma was talking about, like he didn't just neglect, like he keeps pursuing and keeps doing even punishing and all that stuff. It's all indication of love. Also, just like in, in the book of Isaiah, how he kept warning and threatening. I'm going to do this to you. I will do And here too, I will. He didn't do it yet, but I will destroy. I will make them a forest. Um, Lost my train of thought. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. We were talking about how the simple fact that God warns or threatens means two things. Number one, there's still hope. Because if there was no more hope, he would stop warning or threatening. Like, why, why, why try to do CPR on somebody who has been dead for a few days or a few years or whatever? It doesn't make sense. And then the second thing, it's, that means he loves us. He cares about so much, even though we frustrate him so much. <laughs> um, some parents, the wise ones, actually, while they're punishing their kids, they tell them, you know, this hurts me more than you. Or, you know, I'm doing this because I love you. <laughs> I heard a, a sermon once where, where the... The speaker was saying about how, like, when when their dad would punish them when they were it was an old man, but like, when when their dad would punish them when they were little, he would tell them, you know, I'm doing this only because I love you. And then he said, growing up, I knew I was my dad's favorite <laughs> because of all the punishment <laughs> he gave me more than all of them. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, any anyone else? Does anybody else wanna? Share anything? Can I say a joke? Sure. Uh, the teacher uh, used to punish um, a student, and the student got upset of this punishment always. And he's and and the teacher told them, um, "I'm punishing you because I love you." And then the student answered and said, "Also, I love you, but I don't know what should I do." <laughs> That's maybe a threat. <laughs> All right. Abuna, can I say something? Oh, please. I just find it a little bit like stressful for me, specifically, Yani, personally. Mm. The part of being or the part of trying to do everything by the book, you know? Because at the end, I'm a human and I fall and I sin, you know? I don't know, but it's it's a bit. I don't know in which verse it was, but I, I but there was a verse or like what I understood. It's like we have to be like so conscious twenty four hours. So you know, it's like, and I don't know. For me personally, I feel like sometimes it's very stressful. It's like being on guard always. Like what I'm thinking. Mm. What did I feel? Why did I feel that? Why did I saw that? Oh my God, another thing, you know? And I'm tired. So okay. I don't know. And I know it's like, you said like, I think you always say like the righteous person falls seven times a day or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm right. I, mean, I don't say it. Proverbs says that, but okay. Yeah, like but you yeah, you mentioned it yeah. a lot. But I, and I don't think I'm a righteous person, but in the same time, how like to... I don't know how to chill and relax and understand we are human too. Hmm. And we sin too, you know? I don't know. Yeah, God's word is just mind boggling because actually the answer to your question is at the end of this chapter. Um, and I, I think it has to do with looking at God as our Baal, as our master. Versus looking at God as our husband. Um, I, I, I think the more we know God, the more we will want to live by the book, but just because we love him so much, we don't want to do anything that upsets him. It's... It's more about him as opposed to about me. I'm trying to be perfect or I'm trying to do right versus I'm trying to be in his will and I'm trying to be always pleasing to him, delightful to him or delighting to him. Like I want to be his mirth. I don't know. Um I think the more we know God, the more we will shift from this to that. 
Um, it's not that the person is relishing God's love so much that they become lackadaisical. They say, oh, God is merciful, so merciful, so yellow, let's play. Uh, no, it's actually the opposite. It's, it's the more it's, it's driven out of love, the more it becomes a part of us as opposed to something we really have to work on. And even when we mess up, because we will mess up, um, we'll be sad and disappointed, but not... I don't know what the term is. So angry with ourselves? I don't know. I don't know if that answers it or, or not, or if I'm just rambling. Does anybody have anything to uh, address this? What is it? No, it's okay. I'm not going to go through all this. Yanni, maybe we'll save this, Yanni. Uh, Roma, save it, write it down or something. And uh, let's let's see what, Yanni, when we cover uh, the rest of the chapter next time, Yanni will address this, inshallah. God will. Okay. okay. Let's pray. Thank you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, uh, the only Father God, your your love is overwhelming, um, is mind-boggling. Uh, doesn't make sense your pursuit is so sweet and so confident lord even your chastisement to us even when it is painful it is joyful because we know oh lord and we believe that is um, fueled by your love for us and by your desire to save us and that everything you do, Lord, is is for our good and for our salvation. Help us, O Lord, to have attentive ears and to have good memory and to have soft hearts that are listening to you and that are obedient to you, not uh, out of fear, but more out of love and out of trust that everything you want us to do, Lord, and you tell us to live by is for our own good and for our salvation. Um, help us, O Lord, to grow into being a little bit more like you with our with each other and with ourselves. We ask you to please hear us through the intercessions that may and all you seen some others will please you from the beginning and through the mighty power of your love giving cross. Please O oh Lord make us ready to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily breath. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begun. Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Yes. Bye, Charles. See you in the next Bible study. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye, all. Thank you.